Knight City, it began as an empty plot on the California coast, where Richard Knight, visionary architect and entrepreneur, willed into existence a city meant to embody his ideals, to break from what he saw as the mistakes of the past. After his death, the megacorporations took control, and the city mushroomed into a sprawling metropolis, its growth directed by economic highs and lows rather than by any singular plan. Today, Night City is home to over five million people. Dozens of different cultures and ethnic groups intermix and form homogenous communities that lend a distinct look to the districts in which they live. Watson was once a thriving part of Night City, it was home to corporate offices, nightclubs, a top-end med center, and a prosperous industrial subdistrict that provided employment for its residents. Then economic and natural disasters hit. Power and wealth moved downtown, and Watson was left to rot on the periphery, a virtual colony of the corporate core of Night City. That tumultuous history has left its visual markers in the styles we see in Watson today. A wall of austere skyscrapers fronts the canal separating Watson from city center, like a neo-militarist screen built to block the corporation's view of the grime they left behind. This verticality continues through Little China, then gradually gives way to the low, ramshackle kitsch of Kabuki, before ending in the sweeping horizontal entropism of the Northside Industrial District and the austere, fortified neo-militarism of the Arasaka waterfront. In the midst of it all, we have Watson's inhabitants, squeezed between the brutality of the corporations on the one hand and of the gangs on the other. For all their impoverished surroundings and bleak lives, they imbue the district with undeniable color and energy. In an earlier period, the Northside Industrial District was the workshop of Night City, a mini Manchesterian cluster of mills abutting the metropolis's heart. Its factories gave jobs to thousands and pumped out the goods that brought in the city's wealth. Now, factories and workers alike have been outclassed and abandoned, leaving behind a skeleton of smokestacks as souvenirs. The buildings are entropic in form, simple, boxy, and horizontal, with tacked on kitsch graffiti and advertisements. A wide road winds amongst them, and a massive AV hangar fills a whole block, an impressive hub dating from the district's glory days. Yet while one can pass through with relative ease, those left living here have it hard, working 18-hour days in the few factories still operational and carving out a life in the rubble with the time that remains. The Arasaka Corporation purchased a large chunk of Watson and transformed it into an ultra-modern manufacturing and logistics facility. Arasaka raised the crumbling structures of old Watson and in their place erected a neo-militarist behemoth a vast, walled complex defended by guards and automated turrets. This sea of warehouses, hangars, and autonomous assembly lines dramatically overwhelms the human form and bluntly pounds home the message with 100-meter Arasaka logos. Here, the corporate machine rules, and man is nothing. Little China is a vibrant town within a town, grafted onto the remains of Watson's abandoned business center. When big money bailed, immigrants poured into and remodeled the now affordable structures. The result is a bustling, chaotic space, a skeleton of early century corporate architecture spliced with elements of mid-century kitsch. Little China, to the south especially, remains vertical, but its office buildings have been repurposed for housing and small-scale industry, with new additions plopped on top or extended over them. Its residents live out their entire lives in the district, or even in one building. One might sleep on the balcony, repair cyber limbs in the former supply closet, and get grub from a noodle chef working out of the kitchen of a single former corporate office. There is plenty of entertainment on offer in Little China. It is crammed with restaurants and gambling dens that cater to tighter budgets than downtown or Japantown. When night falls, suits share its streets with fixers, mercenaries, and gang members, united in their search for cheap thrills. Yet it is primarily a district run by and for locals, 
a place whose vibrant yet grimy kitsch style emerged organically, not for the benefit of tourists. Kabuki's name is an artifact from an earlier era, when the area was controlled by Japanese medical corporations. Now, no one controls Kabuki. It is a shanty town, a sprawling bazaar where you can acquire literally anything, legal or more often not, for the right price. It is a tangle of tiny alleyways, a warren of seedy shops, small stalls and food carts, a world on a different scale than most of the city. Unlike the urban canyons of other districts, Kabuki's provisional low-rise architecture reveals open skies and lets enough sun peek through to power solar generators. With trash cans rolling across its dusty streets like tumbleweeds, here, Far East meets Wild West in a unique blend possible only in Night City. Westbrook is Night City at its most opulent. Money earned in the city's other districts comes here to be spent. Stylistically, here the neo-militarism of the city center gains a veneer of sleek, high-tech kitsch as it enters Japantown, then is deified into the celestial gardens of the uber-rich atop North Oak. Grime is still present, of course, and gangs and graffiti still abound. But in Westbrook, we catch a glimpse of the carrot dangled in front of the noses of Night City's masses. The message? Work hard, and one day you might own a slice of this. Or, as a shortcut, take out a loan and pretend you own it for one glorious night. Never mind that you'll spend the rest of your life paying it off. Japantown is Night City's answer to what would happen if Las Vegas had a love child with Kabukicho. This is the city's entertainment district. It's where the party's at. Massive billboards cover its buildings, and hollow ads spill into the street to urge you to join the fun. The city's urban delirium is cranked to 11, made purposefully disorienting so you lose track of time, and more importantly, how much you've spent. Japantown's efforts to offer something for everyone are aided by its location and its height. Tucked between city center, where the corporate titans work, and North Oak, where they keep their luxurious villas, it has erected skyscraper casinos as a net, hoping to catch a bit of the unimaginable wealth in the AVs commuting over it. At the same time, the towers act like giant billboards, their bright lights clearly visible from Watson and Charter Hill. Whereas corporate plaza's verticality looms and intimidates, here it entices and attracts, encouraging have-nots and almost-haves alike to come pretend, for a night, that they have. In 2077, green is the new gold. Nothing grows unless you shower it with euro dollars. A bonsai tree on your balcony is like a luxurious watch on your wrist today, an attempt to subtly let everyone know you're rich. An entire forest in your backyard? Like carving your name and net worth on the moon. North Oak is all about such mind-boggling displays of wealth, but the night citizens who gape at them from the districts below are only the lesser part of the intended audience. Mostly, the outrageous villas and exotic menageries are intended to cow peers and rivals during invitation-only soirees. Though their effect on visitors is carefully calculated, North Oak Villas do not neglect the needs of their owners. After a hard day hoarding wealth in the austere surroundings of city center, corporate titans find repose in the soothing contours and natural materials of their homes. From infinity pools atop mansions designed by star architects, surrounded by space-harvested metals and organically bred pets, they take in a curated view of the city in all its varied splendor, knowing they are its masters. Care is taken to blend North Oak's small army of security agents and automated defense systems into the landscape, but some walls and checkpoints stand out nevertheless. Likewise, there is no hiding the ugly brown badlands that abut the estates, or the smoky hellscapes of the oil fields just visible on the horizon. While the gods among men of Night City relax in the pseudo-natural environs of North Oak, the mid-level executive suits who live in Charter Hill get no reprieve from the brutal aesthetics of corporate life. 
The high-rise apartment towers of this district do not differ all that much in their basic style from the gargantuan office buildings of city center. One can even imagine haggard corporate employees forgetting whether the elevator is whisking them home or to the office. That said, flats in Charter Hill are highly coveted and offer the best version of night city life a mere mortal can realistically obtain. Here, the city is relatively clean, well-policed, and well-connected. To top it off, you have a clear view of North Oak to fuel your fantasies of what could be yours if you climbed to the top of the ladder. In the opposite direction, the toxic dumping grounds of Arroyo feed nightmares of what awaits if you slip off. From a distance, downtown Night City resembles a fortress, a Tuscan hill town where thick walls surround a huddled cluster of towers, its architecture designed to keep barbarians and rivals at bay. Here we see neo-militarism in its purest form. Corporate power makes itself forcefully known, projecting with mind-boggling mass and overwhelming firepower the message that you, the individual, should just give up now. In truth, this pageantry is akin to a TSA checkpoint, a forceful show of security born of deep insecurity. Night City's center was obliterated by a nuclear explosion in the 2020s in what was deemed a terrorist attack by the authorities. The destruction left behind a lasting sense of fragility on the part of Night City's corporations, a fear that, for all their power, a determined few armed with the right weapons could burn their domain to the ground. The resultant overcompensation turned the center into a fortified Mordor, where every tool of surveillance and control is employed to keep people in check. Though in truth locked down and thoroughly corporate controlled, downtown feels loose and relaxed compared to corporate plaza. There's plenty to do by way of entertainment, but it's not quite fun like Japantown is. It is not a district designed for your pleasure, but which pleasures you as a calculated move to maximize your productivity. Few actually live downtown, but its streets are still filled with life. During the day, pedestrians swarm, taking care of the business of keeping Night City in business. While at night, tourists and corporate employees on vacation a few hundred yards from their offices stumble from their downtown hotels to its many bars and clubs. All in all, downtown is classic cyberpunk. Corridors of glass and steel, seas of pedestrians, in-your-face ads on every corner. In terms of our styles, here you find controlled kitsch, busy, bright, and colorful, but against a neo-militarist backdrop that reminds you this is still corporate turf. By 2077, corporations have assumed many of the prerogatives formerly reserved for nation states. They claim extraterritorial privileges that grant immunity to their employees and agents. They maintain private armies and wage private wars, both openly and covertly. They sign treaties with other corporations and even with sovereign nations. As a result, Corporate Plaza resembles an embassy district or the United Nations headquarters in New York, a space where independent and often hostile powers have staked out a shaky truce, a demilitarized zone where diplomacy can take place and operations be carried out in safety. Corporate Plaza is the purest expression of neo-militarism, the buildings serve as weapons in the corporation's never-ending wars and look the part. Aggressive, fortified, domineering. Standing here, you feel like you're at the center of a universe ready to gobble you up and spit you out. In some ways, Haywood is the Westbrook of the Southeast, a bedroom and bar borough in a semicircle outside the city center. Haywood trends decidedly more down market, true, but it has the same basic ingredients. Japantown's role as neon-lit money sponge is played by the strip of restaurants and shopping malls near the coast in Well Springs. Charter Hill's offer of aspirational yet achievable real estate is echoed by Haywood's modest middle areas. North Oaks Villas are... Well, Haywood has some nice townhouses. In most ways, though, Haywood is unique. By 2077, the middle class has mostly disappeared, forced into poverty as the ridiculously rich got ridiculously richer. Yet somehow, Haywood manages to approximate a middle-class district all the same. 
Here live those who can scrape together enough to get out of Watson, Pacifica, or the wastelands outside town, but not enough to buy their way into Charter Hill. These lucky few cling tightly to their recognizably decent standard of living. It is no surprise, then, that Haywood's residents love their district. Warts, violent gangs and all, with fierce pride. The Glen is Night City's government district, home to and owned by City Hall. A quick glance at the illustration of this seat of municipal authority compared to those of corporate headquarters should tell you what you need to know about the relative distribution of wealth and power. Then City Councilman Lucius Rhine's deal with Arasaka in 2070 gave Night City its independence from the countries around it, but at the price of ceding much control of the city itself to corporations, Arasaka first and foremost. The transfer of power was physically reflected in the rebuilding of Corporate Plaza, which forced City Hall out of the center and into this less than prime piece of real estate. Its northern edge, that closest to city center, verges on tolerable and even attractive. A peaceful park borders a row of elegant skyscrapers, and behind them, City Hall itself. Heading south, however, the Glen quickly becomes impoverished and crime-ridden. It merges into Vista del Rey, where the Valentinos are the true rulers of gritty, though colorful, streets. For the adventurous, or just those with few choices, there is still fun to be had, but overall, life is nasty, grim, and short. Wellsprings Coastal Strip is the safest, densest, and loudest part of Haywood. This can be thought of as Night City's Venice Beach, a place to be seen for celebrities and the chance to see them for nobodies, where you can dine on cheap scop hot dogs or ridiculously expensive organic seafood. It is chock full of kitsch, oversized mascots, over-the-top slogans, anything that will grab your attention. The architecture is laid back, not so much decaying as casual, with the washed out vibe of a beach town. At the same time, plenty of wealth is on display, be it in the luxury yachts anchored off the promenade or the spacious condos and its high-rise apartment buildings. Head east and things transition fast. Suddenly, you're surrounded by Night City's rarest creature, the middle class. The apartment buildings are of moderate height and adequately nice. There are movie theaters, gas stations, drive through espresso joints. If it weren't for all the AVs and implants, you'd swear you're in a gentrifying early 21st century American city. Keep going, though, and you'll remember where you really are. Wellsprings East is as rife with unemployment, shanties, and gang activity as any of Night City's other impoverished districts. Towering mega-buildings containing tens of thousands of tiny apartments. In their shadow, a failed attempt to create a suburban utopia of single-family dwellings. Stark contrasts mark every corner of Night City, but few are starker than Santo Domingo's. Here, verticality abuts sprawl. Factories and power plants sit right next to supposedly idyllic residential neighborhoods, and the whole urban planning concept of separate functional zones is flipped the bird. Santo Domingo is something like your trashy cousin's backyard, full of broken down pickups and moldy garden gnomes. It is a district that has undergone constant change. It's cheap land where every mad scheme gets a shot, then is swept clean to make way for the next one. Think of this as the Southside Industrial District and you're not far off, except Arroyo somehow manages to be even dirtier and more derelict than its northern cousin. Its factories focus on heavy metallurgy, or at least did, before the majority went bankrupt. When they shut their doors, they left a dozen mega buildings worth of newly unemployed neighbors standing outside. The only gainful employment to be had was either with gangs or security corporations keeping gangs away from the few still active factories. Arroyo is entropism with a neo-militarist edge, a district of teetering chimneys and crumbling but still imposing mega-buildings. Yet the people who live here are colorful and feisty, as reflected in the kitsch graffiti and outfits we see at street level. Tree-lined cul-de-sacs, backyard pools, red tile roofs and a rocking chair on every porch. Rancho Coronado was supposed to have it all, 
the 20th century suburban dream recreated in a dried up riverbed by the old Petrochem Dam Cum landfill on the edge of town. The glossy brochures wrote themselves, leave the meat grinder of the city behind and live in a self-contained slice of paradise. You'll have shops, services, and entertainment right in the neighborhood and good jobs in the Arroyo factories next door. You'll never have to return to Night City proper again. The funding and will to actually achieve this vision never materialized. Rancho Coronado is a half-assed simulacrum of a suburb, a glorified shantytown slapped down on toxic soil next to a dump. Still, many are happy to live there. Its corporate owners pay for a private security force, so it's fairly safe. Tiny cookie-cutter houses are no North Oak villas, but they sure beat the rat holes in Arroyo mega buildings. And while garbage AVs constantly spill trash on you, some of it you can fix up or sell. Squint, and Pacifica almost looks like the tantalizing vision that gave its initial investors stiffies. Hotels with ocean views and private pools, an amusement park to bring in that family vacation euro dollar, a beach complete with a pier, umbrellas, and okay, garbage. But that's the price of being next to Night City. And that prime location is what would make this resort a money-making machine. Those investors didn't stay hard for Pacifica for long, however. Mid-construction, hotter opportunities came along and they pulled out, leaving the half-finished buildings to rot. Gangs moved in and the would-be beachfront paradise became a war zone. The city gave up on fixing or bulldozing it and just walled the whole place off. What was supposed to be every visitor's first stop is now a hostile hellhole you can't enter even if you're crazy enough to want to. As a result, Pacifica serves as 2077's version of a hallowed cyberpunk tradition. The Combat Zone, a place where bullets can fly without any cops or civilians getting in the way. Spend enough time in Night City and you start to wonder why anyone would want to live here. Beyond the city limits, you stop wondering real quick. Things are a hell of a lot worse outside. Unchecked resource extraction, rampant pollution, and a climate in crisis do not make for a happy weekend getaway. For all its flaws, at least Night City gives you moments of reprieve. In its flashing casinos and slick cocktail bars where you can forget your miserable life for an hour and pretend that everything is going to be fine and dandy in the wasted badlands and burning oil fields outside the city. The smell of dystopia, or is it just the sulfur, never leaves your nostrils. Beyond the city's borders, we find entropism at its ugliest, but also at its grandest in terms of scale. Looking down from an AV or an airplane approaching the city, you see endless rows of solar panels and windmills, acres and acres of greenhouses, huge open pit oil fields. You can't help but be impressed. You see just what it cost to keep a resource intensive economy going for another century. The natural world, California's great legacy, is dead. Or shall we say undead? Though oil was never Night City's main economic driver, it still played a vital role in the city's history. Richard Knight chose Coronado Bay as the location for his grand project, in part because one of his corporate investors, Petrochem, already owned drilling rights to much of the land. The oil fields north of the city are both testimony and legacy to these insider deals. Pitch black, smoke-filled, and flooded with oil-tainted water, they present a stark contrast both to the dusty, oversaturated, sun-baked feel of other outer districts and the sanitized sheen of city center visible on the horizon. A highway heads east out of Night City and straight into a post-apocalyptic Wild West. This is nomad territory, hence the provisory architecture. Tents, trailers, and camper vans. The only permanent structures are abandoned relics. Ghost towns scavenged and repurposed by wandering folk. Stylistically, entropism rules here since everything must serve maximal purpose at minimal cost. Yet it is far more likely to be DIY and jury-rigged than mass-produced corporate junk. The ostentatious, blaring kitsch of Night City's entertainment districts is completely absent. 
Though the nomads have a vibrant visual identity featured in the patches they sew on their clothes and the graffiti they tag on their rides. These splashes of color are however the exceptions in a region dominated by two elements, blinding sunlight and choking dust. Somewhat paradoxically, the desert to the south of Night City blossoms and glistens. Massive corporate owned farms stretch out as far as the eyes can see producing synthetic food in a highly mechanized process vaguely resembling agriculture. Meanwhile, flat fields of solar panels convert the abundant sunlight into electricity. Tall turbines do the same with the unceasing coastal wind. The overall impression is one of paradox. Tightly packed empty space. Uninhabited land deeply marked by human habitation. The stomach and spinal cord shunted outside the body.